Well, this morning we are going to be looking at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and we'll be dealing with verses 1 through 21. 1 through 21. And as we just sang, this song is going to be about Jesus, the Good Shepherd. How Jesus is the one who leads us, how he's the one who guides us. And I think it's very important that we see him that way because in the world that we live in today, we certainly need some leading and we certainly need some guiding because there are a lot of wolves in sheep clothing out there. There's a lot of thieves and robbers. But Jesus, Jesus is the one that will get us through all of this craziness. So that's what we're going to be reading about today. But before we begin the passage, uh, I do want to take a moment to pray, and I do remind you of a few things we can be praying for. One, we can be uh, praying for the upcoming events like Trunk Retreat and the worship night because we never know who might come to that. could be somebody's first time, and it's an opportunity to connect and to share the gospel with somebody. So be praying for those opportunities. Also praying for our country and our nation, again, as we are nearing uh, an election. Again, things can be tense, things can be uncomfortable, but again, God is on the throne. So we need not worry, we need not despair, we just pray, we trust, we do our part, and we keep pushing forward. Also praying for those uh, on the east side and the the areas of the hurricane, Florida and uh, other places, um, still recovering, you know, still many without power, many... uh, just having difficulties. It's a very hard season for many people. So be praying for them. Uh, many of you have family members there. Um, and so it's, it's, there's so much. Sometimes we feel helpless. Sometimes we don't know what to do. How could I do something? Well, what I would encourage you in simply in this morning is the fact, the truth, that your prayer has power. Your prayer has power because of the one that we're praying to. We're praying to an almighty God that can move mountains, that parted the Red Sea, that raised Jesus from the dead. That is the God in which we pray to, and we have access to Him. So I never want you to feel like praying does nothing, because praying does everything. Praying is the vehicle in which God moves in this earth. So don't feel like just praying is not enough. Yes, if you feel led to give, if you feel led to fly down there and help people, then, then by all means do that. But sometimes the best thing we can do is to pray. So we'll be praying for these things. So now let's take a moment to do that. You can also look at the back of your bulletin too. There's others on here that need prayer. So let's take a moment now to pray. Heavenly Father, Gracious Lord, we come before you this morning in humility, Lord, because we are sinful. We are rebellious. Lord, there is so much that we do that is wrong, but nevertheless, your grace covers us. And I pray now that as we approach the throne of grace, Lord, that you would hear our prayers and petitions, Lord. And I know that you hear them. And so, Father, we want to pray for those that have been affected by these hurricanes. We pray, Father, for your provision. We pray for healing. We pray for restoration. We ask, Lord, that you would move in these places, help to restore power, help people to recover, provide the means necessary to do these many difficult tasks, Lord. But again, with you, nothing is impossible. And we pray for our nation, Lord. We pray for our leaders, Father. We need wisdom. And we need humility, Lord. I pray that this nation would humble itself before you once again. I ask, Lord, that you, Father, would help us as the church to humble ourselves before you. Even the church has become proud, Lord. But help us to sit before you in utter humility, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our trespasses. And help us to walk in your grace, Lord. Father, I pray for us now as we read your word, that you would speak, that your word would go forth, that you would help me to communicate it, but Father, that your spirit would move upon the hearts of the people here and that we would hear and receive what you have for us this morning. And help us, Lord, to just sit still and to abide in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I've entitled this sermon, The Shepherd and His Sheep. And we're going to be looking at the unique relationship between the shepherd and between his sheep. What role do we play in as God's sheep and what role does Jesus play as the good shepherd? So let's go ahead and look to the passage now. John chapter 10. And we'll be beginning in verse 1, reading through 21. Would you please stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning? John chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the word of the Lord for this Lord's day. You may be seated. So what I want to begin to look at this morning is our role as the sheep. It's a funny illustration. It's a funny connection that Jesus makes. He calls us sheep. It's funny because, as you know, uh, particularly being out here in farm country, I'm sure many of you know that sheep are not the brightest of animals. They are very, very dumb. They will do things very foolishly. You know, they'll, they'll get stuck in a hole. You get them out, and they'll jump right back in the same hole. Sheep are very... Hard to take care of, too. You have to watch them. You have to be careful, especially when they start to uh, grow their coat. They c- become very heavy, and they become downcast, and they fall over. And if they're off in a field somewhere and you don't know where they are, they can die in a matter of hours. So sheep are very delicate. Sheep are very sensitive. You must keep diligent eyes upon your sheep. So we are the sheep, though. We are God's sheep. And then this passage tells us a few things that we as the sheep should do. So let's look at verse 1 and 2. Jesus says that those who do not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. And we'll talk more about who those thieves and robbers are later. But look at verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens... And the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. 
When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So one of our duties as God's sheep, one of the most important things that we are supposed to do is to listen to the shepherd's voice. We are to listen and to wait and to discern his voice. The reason we do this is because, one, back in that day when they would be out in the fields, you would have various shepherds in various folds, and sometimes they would bring them in uh, together, uh, but they would keep them in separate places or draw them out and go certain areas. And so, again, not to get mixed up with whose sheep is whose, the sheep knew their shepherd's voice. And so when you have the sheepfold and you have the gatekeeper, when the shepherd comes and says, hey, I'm here for my sheep, he will call out to his sheep, and the sheep, when they hear it, will know it and will come out to find their shepherd. But they're not going to go, if it's my sheep and David comes, let's say I have sheep, but David comes and he tries calling my sheep, they're not going to listen to David because they do not know a stranger's voice. So it is our responsibility as the sheep to become very well acquainted with our shepherd's voice. You must be able to discern it. You must be able to recognize it. But more importantly, once you have heard it, you must listen to it. Because if you don't listen to it, one, you could be left behind, especially if you're in the field, the shepherd's calling you to come in, but you're like, no, I'm going to keep munching this grass because it's pretty good grass. And you stay out there rebelliously. But what happens when you find yourself alone in a field by yourself as a sheep? A mountain lion, a wolf, a thief, or a robber is going to find you very appealing, and you become very easy and a very easy target to them. So you must be able, you must not let distractions keep you from hearing the shepherd's voice because that's your safety, he is your protector. So when Jesus speaks to you, and he does speak to his people, do you hear his voice? Are you able to discern it? When you're about to do something stupid, do you hear that voice within you saying, don't do that? If you don't hear it, and you find yourself often doing the wrong thing, it might be because you don't know your shepherd's voice. But how can you get to know that shepherd's voice. Well, one, you become more and more sensitive to that small, quiet voice that you hear. You know, when he says, don't do that or don't go that way or don't hang out with that person because it's not good for you, we all kind of get that feeling from time to time, but it's do we listen to it? Do we obey it? That comes with practice. That comes with skill. But a way that you can develop that, the way that you can grow that to where you really know this is my shepherd speaking to me, is you have his book right here for you. This book teaches you the voice of the shepherd, what it sounds like. So when he speaks, you will know without a shadow of a doubt, that's my shepherd, I need to get going. Or that's my shepherd, I need to listen and to wait. So we must listen to our shepherd's voice. That is our responsibility. And as this passage says, right, the gatekeeper opens, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. I also think that's a beautiful statement that Jesus, if you belong to him, you're his sheep. He knows you by your name, and he loves you, and he cares for you. It's a beautiful thing. Now, verse 4 again, when he has brought out all his own, his own, right? Jesus is there for his sheep to care for them, to provide for them. He's there for his own. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him. So the second thing about our role as the sheep is not only do we need to hear his voice and listen to it, but when he comes for us, and when he's ready to lead us where he wants us to go, we must follow him. Look at verse 5. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. You know, it reminds me of little kids sometimes. Uh, Sometimes they get confused about who their parent is because they get so busy playing and they're just into it. Like I remember there were times we were leaving the grocery store and I'm walking out with somebody and I look up and I'm like, you're not my dad. Who are you? You ever done that before? Where you accidentally started walking with the wrong person? Maybe it's just me. Again, I'm a sheep. I'm stupid. 
So we do things that we shouldn't do, like walk out with the wrong person. Now, let's just say I went with that person and, and you know, hopefully they were a kind person and would take me back where I need to go. Uh, but again, there are those who are wicked and evil and would seek to steal and take advantage of anybody that they can. But again, our responsibility is to follow, to follow Jesus as he leads us. To do that, we must know his voice. But when he comes, when he opens the gate and leads us out, we must follow in his footsteps. Why is that? Because he's going to lead us to the places that we need to go. He's going to lead us to the still waters. He's going to lead us to the green pastures. And that's important because, one, if you bring a sheep to running water, they're not going to drink from it. And if they do, they will likely fall in and drown. Sheep don't like running water, so typically they won't drink from it. But again, if they do, they may find themselves in danger. So the shepherd must take their sheep to still waters. That's why it says that in Psalm 23. You must find the still water, but who can lead you to it? Jesus can. So we must follow him where he leads us, but he will also take us to the best pastures, those places of rest and those places of nourishment. I know from personal experience that I'm really bad at finding the right things to use as rest. We often might use our phones and we scroll for hours and we think it's restful, but we walk away feeling dumber than before. Again, maybe that's just me, but Jesus will lead you to the places that will give you true rest. You ever just feel like you need that deep within your soul? Like, I just need to actually rest. I need my soul to be restored and rejuvenated. I know you've been there. I know you have. Jesus can take you to that place where you can find absolute true rest for your soul. But you must be willing to follow Him. You must know His voice and seek after Him as the Good Shepherd. But again, it's also for your own safety because, again, you try to go out and do these things on your own. You might drown in the river. You might find yourself in a pasture that has no grass to eat because the other reality is, too, you put a bunch of sheep in an area to eat, they eat the grass pretty quick. And if you don't move them, if the shepherd doesn't come and lead them to a new place, they're going to die because they're not going to know where to go or what to do. So the shepherd leads them from pasture to pasture to pasture to help them find the nourishment that they need. And God will do that in your life. He will move you from place to place. He'll say, this place is no longer good for you anymore. The grass is gone. The river is dried out. We must move. But some of us get so stuck in our ways, we want to say, no, I like this place. I'm familiar with it. I want to stay here. But when Jesus says, move on and follow me, We must be willing to follow him and to trust him that the next place he leads us to is going to be a place with fresh water, with new grass for us to rest and to be nourished. Now the third reason, I'm pretty much already talking about it, our responsibility as the sheep is simply to rest and be nourished. It's kind of nice being a sheep when you think about it. When I'm not being Jesus' under-shepherd as a pastor, when I'm not being that, I love being a sheep because it's nice just to sit and to rest and to eat some food, to take a nap. That's real nice. See, we don't have to work for God's love, for his grace. We don't have to earn a right to be taken to the good places. We don't have to do that because he loves us already so much that he wants to take care of us and bring us to the best places anyway. Whether we earned it or deserved it or not, He will take care of you, not because of anything good that you've done, but because He loves you, because you belong to Him. And He will take you to those places of rest and nourishment. And all you have to do is say, okay, some of you, some of you just need to sit down and rest. Some of you just need to stop and wait a minute and let Jesus take you to the place of rest and you just need to sit down and not do anything because it's so important to just sit and rest and do nothing and I think that's especially important for this community because you all are such hard working people I know you are 
You all outwork me ten times. But it's also important to rest. Jesus gave us a command that one day out of the week we ought to take as a Sabbath rest. And who is our Sabbath rest? Jesus is. One day out of the week, set it aside to seek Him and to know Him and to rest in His glorious presence. Again, I think that's something lost and forgotten because when we think of rest, we think of going to the golf course or, again, sitting down and watching a movie and doing these various things. And yes, they can be restful, and we ought to do them when necessary. But remember that true soul rest comes by spending time with Jesus. So you must seek that out first and foremost, sitting in the presence of your shepherd. Because he will fill you and nourish you with everything that you need. That's why we talk about having a quiet time in the morning. It's not so that you can just check it off. It's so that you can start your day in a positive attitude. So that when you leave to work, you don't end up cussing that guy that just cut you off. When you go into work, you don't end up feeling begrudged towards your boss because he's being rude. When you spend that quiet time with God, He gives you peace and patience and joy so that you can live as a reflection of who He is in the world. So we need that desperately. And I just think of animals in general, but I'm sure sheep in particular, if they don't rest, they become restless. I don't imagine that's good for their health. Any animal needs rest. So especially us being made in the image of God, God who rested on the sixth day, we need rest as well. That's what we're called to do. And again, think of what heaven will be. There may be work in heaven. I don't know for certainty. There may be things that we do. But I think a lot of it is just going to be resting in Christ. And that's the beauty and the glory of knowing Jesus is that we can have eternal rest in Him by faith in Him. So those are a few things that we do as the sheep. Again, we listen to the shepherd's voice. We obey what he says. We follow him wherever he leads us. And we rest and are nourished by him. But let's take a moment to look at what the role of the shepherd is. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says this. Well, actually, let's start at verse Let's start at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Again, we must know him. We must enter by him to be able to find that rest. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly all right so what is the role of the shepherd number one it's to lead the sheep to pasture to lead them to those places that they need to go to find the rest that they need jesus is the good shepherd who also lays down his life for his sheep what jesus does as the good shepherd is he does whatever necessary to protect us from the outside world And there are, in fact, a lot of dangers for us as sheep. There are a lot of dangers, but Jesus comes in and he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 12, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So again, Jesus, I think one of his primary purpose as a shepherd, and this is a a real thing. So in, in Israel's day, when they would shepherd the sheep in the fields, again, it was a costly thing to be a shepherd because 
you were pretty much out sometimes all day and sometimes all night you would sleep in the field. And so they would have to build these little you know, sheep folds for them. And what they would do is sometimes, you know, maybe they would build it with sticks and maybe put some thorns around it, use trees, logs, again, whatever they could find to build a sheep fold for the sheep to protect them by night. But then the shepherd at the end of it would lay himself down in front of the doorway. He would lay himself, he would literally lay down. So in a physical, literal sense, Jesus lays himself down before the sheep. So that way, if anything comes in, they have to go through him first. So Jesus is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. He will protect them at all costs. But again, it reminds me of Psalm 23 where it talks about how we need not fear because he will guard us with his rod and his staff. He will protect us and keep us safe. And he's willing to do it to the point of losing his own life. And I think that's a beautiful thing to know that when we find ourselves in danger, when the enemy attacks us, Jesus will come. He will defend us. He will protect us. He will deliver us. He will save us, even at the cost of his own life. And that's exactly what he did on the cross, is he gave himself up for his sheep so that they would live. That's what Jesus did as the good shepherd. He gives his life for them. And that's why being a pastor, again, I am not the good shepherd. I am hardly a shepherd, but what Jesus calls us is under shepherds. That's what I am. I report to him and him alone. But again, the pressure and the responsibility to take care of another man's property, another man's sheep, but especially when that property is something that he purchased with his own blood. The responsibility and the weight that I feel for caring for the flock of God is at times tremendous. But then that's where I also find great comfort is because where I fail and where I lack, God makes it up in full because he is the good shepherd. There's no fault in him. So when you feel like I fail you and I have failed many of you, turn to him because he will never fail you ever. That is a promise that he makes to his sheep. He will never fail you. He will give his life for you. And he's proven that already on the cross. The last thing Jesus does as the good shepherd is that he gathers all of his sheep together. And this is a beautiful thing because he's talking about us ultimately in this passage, right? You have the sheep of Israel, those that belong to God, but then he says in verse 16, I have other sheep also that are not of this fold. I must bring them in and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. What's, he's, what's he talking about? Because if you read the New Testament, Jesus says that he came for the house of Israel to save and to seek that which is lost. He came for the Jewish people in particular. But as we read the Gospels, as we, as we read the letters of Paul and others, we learn that Jesus also came to save the Gentiles. Now what is a Gentile? It's basically anybody that's not a Jew. So we here, unless you're Jewish, we are all considered Gentiles. Gentiles were considered sinners, unclean, unbeloved. But what does God say? He says, I call you my own you are part of my flock as well. And so Jesus comes in and he saves those outside of the house of Israel. And that's a beautiful thing because that means you and I can have a relationship with God. We can know him personally and intimately and we should know him. But Jesus will gather all of his sheep together. I also think it's a beautiful image of the end of times when the whole church all of God's people will be gathered together and there truly will be one flock. There will be no more denominations, no more churches everywhere. We will be one people in heaven above. One tribe, one nation. All, you know, we, we will be truly unified. And I think that's a lot of what we need right now is unity. We need peace with our brothers and our sisters. We need peace in our hearts. We need forgiveness. We need to let go of bitterness because one day... Again, you may have something against someone here in this church or somewhere, somewhere else. 
But if God calls you his, we are going to be called together as one. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to love each other despite our differences. So is that true of you this morning? So again, I simply remind you, what is the role of the shepherd? He's to lead them to pasture. Or we could define that as he's to care for them. He's to provide for their needs. Secondly, he's to protect them at all costs to the point of laying down his life. And lastly, he is to gather all of his sheep together. Now, at the conclusion of this passage of Scripture, verses 19 through 21, we see a bit of a debate or division happening. It says, There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. And a demon opened the eyes of the blind. Again, referring to the miracle that we just read about last week, Jesus opened the eyes of a man born blind. Never had this been seen before. But we see that there is division between them. And what I call this, reading this passage of Scripture, is it's the division between the sheep and the goats. Uh, also in the book of Matthew, it gives us this illustration that there are sheep, there are goats. The sheep belong to God. And at the end of time, when Jesus returns, he's going to come and divide the sheep. The sheep will be on what side? On what side will the sheep be? On the right. And what side will the goats be on? And which one belong to God? The sheep. Which one does not belong to God? The goats. Jesus is going to return and he's going to separate them. But also, too, in a literal sense, you can't keep sheep and goat together because they get agitated. They don't like being with each other. The, the, the goats will bully the sheep and it's just not, you can't mix them together in close quarters. And so, again, when the shepherds would bring the sheep and the goats in, they would separate them at the end of the day. They would keep them separate because if you don't, you're going to have division like we see here between the Jews and the Jews and the sheep. So I share this simply because there is this reality that, again, there are sheep, there are goats, there will be division. That's why we see so much of the arguing and the fighting that we see today. But Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to divide the sheep and the goats. He's going to separate them, the sheep on his right, the goats on his left, and he's going to bring in his flock and take them to their eternal home. So part of the reason I share that too is because I want you to be thinking as well, whether you're in here, whether you're watching online, are you a part of God's flock? And Jesus tells us there's only one way that we can be a part of God's flock is one, we must heed his calling. We must heed his voice. But secondly, what it says so clearly in verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, I am the door. Verse 8 and 9, Jesus says, Look at verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. There is no other way to be saved than except through Jesus Christ and him alone. So if you desire to have that eternal peace, if you desire to find rest and joy and satisfaction in your life, if you desire to go to be with God in heaven, there is only one way that that will ever happen. And it is to go through the door, which is Jesus. Now, as we finish up, there's one final thing I want to conclude with. And it's a final warning. And that is to be aware or beware of bad shepherds and wolves and sheep's clothing. I want to end with this because as you may notice throughout chapter 10 in these verses, there's a running theme of the sheep being in danger of thieves, of robbers, of wolves, and of cowardly hired hands. And I think what Jesus is getting at in this passage, you know, what is the context? What is he speaking about? He's speaking about these things, talking about the Pharisees and about the Jews, that you guys have been those thieves and those robbers. You guys have been those cowardly hired hands that run away and let my people perish. And they, because of that, have caused the sheep to lose their lives, to be destroyed, and to be lost. Some also, when it says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, we often relate that to being the devil. I do think that is true of the devil. He comes only to steal and kill and destroy. 
but I think this has a double meaning. Again, it's talking about the devil, but more specifically to the context of the passage, he's talking about the Pharisees. He's saying all these things in their presence to condemn them of their actions because they have miscared for the flock of God. But I say this also to you this morning because you must be aware in the day and age where media is accessible and the click of a button, you must be aware of what you're listening to. What is coming into your heart and to your mind? Because you can listen to me, and by God's grace, I do my best to preach the Word of God, but you can go home and watch who else you want to. And that is a good thing, but it can also be a very scary thing because there are many false teachers in the world. Many, many false teachers that want to deceive and to lead you away from Jesus. So we must be discerning. We must be aware of, Firstly, that that is true. Many people don't think it's true. Like, oh, no, that's not true. Like, if, you know, they love God and they're preaching the Bible, what they're saying must be true. I mean, he reads the Scripture. He does. It doesn't matter because I can read this Scripture and I can twist it to make it say anything that I want to, which means we must be like the Bereans and test it and read it and compare it to what God has actually said in His Word because there are going to be false teachers that you will hear Again, there are going to be many voices that come into the sheepfold, and they're going to cause a lot of confusion, a lot of doubt, and a lot of division. But again, if the sheep are able to discern the voice of the shepherd, then we'll be able to sift through all of the nonsense. But again, you must be aware of it yourself. You must study the Word of God so you can clearly call out the false teachings. But even scarier... It's easy to to call out a false teacher because they put themselves in the public. They say things online. And if you know enough, you say, yeah, I'm not going to listen to this guy anymore. But what's even scarier is when there is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Because they will say the same things you do. They will act the way that you act. And they will appear to you as a sheep when, in fact, they are a wolf. But what does the Bible tell us about such things? How can we really test and see, is this a true sheep of God or should I be careful of this person? Well, the Bible tells us plain and simple, you will know them by their fruit. Examine them and watch them. Listen to what they say. What are their motivations? What do they truly desire? What are they trying to do? If there is ever a hint of division, someone trying to get David to be mad at JD and to get them to fight, that's a wolf in sheep's clothing. That is someone who is causing division. And that is something we must be very weary of and careful of. We must be careful because, again, Satan and the enemy and the world will do everything to divide us, to pit us against each other, and to lead us away from Jesus. So we must be careful. And lastly, again, like I said, motivation is a true teller of someone's heart. But also, as this passage tells us, especially about the hirelings that ran away when the wolf came, they were just being paid to do it. So they didn't really care about the sheep because they were just there for a paycheck. And so that's how you can discern, especially for pastors and preachers and those in ministry and leadership. Are they just there for the money? Is all they do is talk about money and their own gain? You'll be able to tell and know very quickly a false teacher, a wolf, if their motivation is their own pocket growing. It's the most easy and most obvious of all to see, but many of us fall for it. Many of us fall for the trap because we think they're holy men or holy women. They say, God will bless us if we do this. We must be careful of what we listen to, of what we take in. Because there are shepherds out there that care nothing about you. I hope that you know that I'm not here for a paycheck, and I hope that you know that I care for you deeply, that I think of you often, that I pray for you frequently, that I often relate to the Apostle Paul where he says, I am so anxious for the churches. Like he, you know, he talks about casting our anxieties on Jesus, yet he also says, I am so anxious for the churches because he cares for their soul. And I care for your soul as well. That's why I say these things. That's why I ask you to question and to test your faith because I don't want anybody to be deceived about where they stand with Jesus. 
because we must make sure that we are with the sheep, that we will be separated to the right. How can you be sure of that today? By professing your faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ alone, by listening to his voice, by entering through the door of Christ. Again, that is the only way that we will find peace and safety in this world. And to the Christian this morning, I believe what God is telling us, what God wants you to know today from this passage is that every Christian in here ought to take that time to listen to the shepherd's voice and to abide in him, to rest in his presence. Because again, that is where you will find the most peace, safety, and joy. So now, as we conclude, let's take a moment to do that. Where you're at quietly, just pray, thank the Lord, seek him. We're going to take communion as well. It's a great opportunity to confess any sin, repent, trust the Lord. But let's go ahead now and conclude with a word of prayer and just, again, sit in His presence. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You that You are the Good Shepherd who cares for us, that You provide all of our needs. And I pray now for this church, Lord, that You provide their needs. And I pray that each of them is able to discern Your voice and to know it, to follow after You. And protect them, Lord, from all of the evil in the world. Protect them from those false teachers. And just help this church to be that one flock, Lord. Help us to be united and just to follow you wherever you might lead us. So help us, Lord, now, again, just to rest and to be nourished by you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.